celebrate this miracle today. Um, obviously, the Jesus causing the fig tree to wither. Uh, like the water walking miracle shows that Jesus is actually going to speak some hard truth to us through the use of miracles. Um, to receive that truth, though, we have to, and to let it motivate us, we've actually got to dig deep into this. It's a very brief miracle. It just kind of happened, bam, and it was over. And um, But if we dig deep, we'll find a buried treasure in it, just as Jesus digs deep into us, right? Because we are his treasures, right? So he digs deep, and we dig deep, and we're like hidden in Christ, which is a good thing. So obviously, you see on your study guides, this uh, miracle is recorded in Matthew 21 and Mark 11. And if you were to read both of those in their entirety, you would see some of the same details. However, Mark records them chronologically, while Matthew records them topically. And Matthew leaves the exact timing out. And so if you were to read them side by side, you would see what looks like some apparent contradictions. And Pastor Mark alluded to that last week with the, with the miracle that we did last week. So you'd see these apparent contradictions in what went down. But when we carefully examine the wording and context, which we're not going to do today because we'd never get to the miracle if I had to walk us through all of that. Um, you, but if you did, you'd see that it clears up the contradiction. I'll point them out um, briefly as we walk through. Um, but we're going to primarily use Mark 11. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can open to Mark 11 because you'll kind of f follow along. We're not going to do a lot of reading out loud today because there's a lot of information that I want to get to you. Um, we're using Mark 11 because that's laid out sequential sequentially as things happened, whereas Matthew left out timing. And so it makes it sound like when he when Jesus cleared the temple, he did it all in one saw it and did it one day and then it makes it sound like he withered the tree and and taught them on one day when actually it was over a two day span so we're going to use mark 11 so the setting is in mark 11 verses 1 through 9 and that's where we read the whole what we call palm sunday jesus was about two miles outside jerusalem he sent two disciples ahead you know to get the cult remember that whole story we know how the processional went and people were laying down clothes and palm branches before him and, and uh, behind him saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. All right, so that, that happened. So it's Sunday. <clears throat> and then verse 11 says that Jesus went into the temple and he looked around and he saw what was happening. And do you remember what was happening in the temple? money changers right all right so there's buying and selling and in in as recorded in mark since it was late he looked around he saw what was happening and he left he went back out to bethany which was about two miles east of jerusalem and the disciples went with him if you were to read that in matthew he went in he saw it all going on and he went ballistic <laughs> and he turned tables over and everything but in reality he actually saw it all happening and he went back and went to sleep or maybe he stayed up all night praying, for all we know, after what he saw. Verses 12 through 14 tell us then on Monday morning, Jesus and his disciples came back from Bethany to Jerusalem, remember, two miles, and Jesus was hungry. And that's when he saw uh, in the distance a leafed out fig tree by the road, and he thought, aha, food, yes. Verse 13 says, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Now, to me, it's always interesting when we get this sense in Scripture that Jesus didn't know what was happening, right? So we need to understand that though he was God, Jesus did not exercise his divine powers for miracles all the time. That's that's obvious he didn't even start his public ministry till he was 30 years old did he have the power before 30 i mean he was god right so so and obviously by the wording here perhaps he'd see he he clearly and i, I like to say it this way he clearly had the potential to know that the, there was no fruit on there but he saw it from a distance and he thought oh maybe there's food there maybe maybe not we all think well 
Jesus, you should have known if there was fruit on it or not. And I love, I love that in scripture because it helps us understand that Jesus truly could relate to us in every facet, okay? A little about fig trees in the natural. To see a leafed out fig tree, even if it was out of season, would still have led one to presume there was fruit on it because uh, their fruit generally appears actually before the leaves. Okay, so, and the fruit is green right up until the time that it's ripe. Okay, so the fruit, the, you, it's not like from a distance you would have seen it unless it was in season and they were already dark. Then you would notice it. So it would blend in. And most fig trees produce at least two crops, sometimes three, depending on location, climate, and condition. So they could bear fruit more often. Um, but that also explains to us why Jesus would think perhaps there was fruit on the tree. And he didn't know it until he got closer to see that there wasn't any fruit. So he gets there in response to finding a leafy but fruitless tree. He cursed the tree. I thought, it's a, it's a little radical, Jesus. I mean, he must have been really hungry. <laughs> but he says, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. Whoa. Now, a curse is a pronouncement of judgment. It's actually passing judgment on something. It's not just, you know, a lot of people say, oh, we're not supposed to judge judge people. And, and, and I say, well, actually, we are supposed to. In fact, he says judgment begins in the house of God. We're not supposed to pass judgment on people. You can judge if something's right or wrong, right? Mm -hmm. It'd be silly to say, well, I can't really judge if that's good or bad, right or wrong. Yes, we, we do have that ability, and actually it's our responsibility to judge behavior as sin or not sin. But a curse is actually a judgment on a person or a thing. That's why curses are big deals. <laughs> if people curse you, that's a big deal. you got to break the curse. It's not anything to mess around with, okay, because they've passed judgment on you. So that's the miracle, a curse causing a tree to die or wither up or die. The rest of verse 14, um, after it says, let no one eat fruit from you ever again, says, and the disciples heard it. Just says the disciples heard it. Imagine what they might have been thinking um, hearing him curse the tree. You know, maybe they were a little confused. Um, like maybe they wanted to explain to him, it's not harvest time, so it's okay. <laughs> you don't have to kill the tree. Um, but they didn't say anything, right? They just heard it at that point. And... I, I think that that's, we can kind of relate to that. Have you ever, let's say you've been with somebody and they got irritated because they didn't get what they, you know, expected, maybe from a waitress or a clerk at the store or a referee at a ball game. You didn't get what you expected and then that person, you know, they say something judgmental to that person and you feel super awkward. You might not say anything at the time, or maybe you just walk away, you know, like I don't want to be associated with them, right? That's kind of how I picture the disciples. They, they were, it, it was uncomfortable. I mean, he cursed a tree, and, and um, you know, it doesn't say that in Scripture, but I'm thinking if I was there and he just went up to a tree, I'd be like, that's odd. Let's just get out of here because <laughs> I don't know what you're doing right now. So... I'll finish the setting here uh, before we dig into the purpose of it. Verses 15 to 19 recount to us what more happened on Monday. So he curses the fig tree. They heard it. They go into Jerusalem. They get to the temple, and Jesus picks, off, picks up where he left off the night before. I'm thinking maybe he was thinking about this all night long. Like, what am I going to do when I get there? If they're still buying and selling, this is not going to be pretty. And um, so, yep, he overturns the tables where the money was taken. The Bible says he didn't even let those who had wares carry them through the temple. He was, he's like, you just stop everything right now. And then in Matthew, we read that he taught, well, actually both of them say, he says, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. I know we, we kind of gloss over that sometimes, but that's just a powerful, powerful indictment on, on the church. Um, hopefully, we take it pretty serious as well. These people would have known what was written, 
And so they knew what they should be doing and what shouldn't have been doing. They, should, they knew what should happen in the temple. He just gave them a reminder, as he does for us today. Why do we exist? Why do our churches exist? Matthew tells us that Jesus healed. Mark does not record this, but Matthew tells us Jesus healed people who were blind and lame in the temple. Everybody's ecstatic. Kids, it says that children kept crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. See, the atmosphere when Jesus cleaned it up was changed and charged with praise. Okay, so everybody's noisy because there's all this buying and selling. He overturns everything, and now it's become, it turned back to where, what it was meant to do. However, not everyone's impressed at the wonderful things that were happening. The priests and scribes were watching, and they got angry, and they questioned Jesus. Do you hear what they're all saying? <laughs> I love Jesus' answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I hear what they're saying, and I love when Jesus does this, not always when he does it to me, but I, I love when he, he questions them back. He says, yeah, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? That's another strong indictment on the body of Christ, right? How many people in the body of Christ, not, nobody in this room because we know that, but get upset when kids are praising the Lord? These kids are, are disrupt. I mean, people are getting healed and stuff, but they're like, Hosanna to the son of David. And all the adults are like, shh, shh, <laughs> none of that in here. That's not how we act in church. <laughs> mm, it happens. Do you hear what they're saying, Jesus? Yeah, I do. Kind of like it, he says. Yeah, they have perfect praise. And of course they had read it. Jesus says, have you never read they're scribes and Pharisees, or scribes and chief priests. Of course they had read it. Of course they knew this. So Mark tells us they heard Jesus, uh, Jesus' teaching, and their, their immediate uh, reaction was to try to destroy him. Not just get him out. Let's just destroy him. They feared him, the Bible says, because the people were astonished at his teaching. Isn't that silly? <laughs> I mean... They, were, they, they, they wanted to destroy him because they feared him because people were astonished. Yet, that's what jealousy does to people. Really, this is jealousy in, it, in its fullness. Jealousy causes frustration and fear. We think we're going to be overlooked. And if and the truth is, if we don't acknowledge this jealousy that we sometimes... Does anybody ever feel jealous? Because I do. Am I the only one? Anybody else ever get jealous? <laughs> um, if we don't if we don't deal with that um, it could really eat away at us you know it, it, it can really grow um, and then we go into attack mode like these guys did and we try to destroy people's reputations or um, anything so okay so what a Monday Jesus had Right? All of this happened in one day. They left the city that evening, returning to Bethany. It must have been some great place to stay out in Bethany because he walked two miles, two miles, two miles. Um, went out to Bethany, slept, and the next morning, Tuesday, they headed back into Jerusalem. All right, time to dig for the, di to the treasured truth. In Mark 11, 20 to 21, it says, Now in the morning, this is Tuesday, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Surprise! <laughs> what Jesus said would happen, happened, right? Um, that really reveals to us that they heard what, when it says, and the disciples heard it, they heard what Jesus said did, well, how he cursed the fig tree, but they didn't look or take time to ponder, you know, what they heard. In Mark, um, so in Mark 11 here, the curse happened on Monday, the disciples heard it, but it was Tuesday as they passed by the tree, they remembered what Jesus said on Monday, and Tuesday when Jesus taught his purpose for this miracle, and that his purpose would end up encouraging them and strengthening them in faith. Matthew, however, in Matthew 21, he gives the impression that the withering and the teaching all happened on Monday because he told, um, 
he told those stories separately. So just so you know that, I'm not ignoring that that is different in the Gospels. Um, it might seem like an apparent contradiction, yet the withering would have started immediately. As soon as Jesus cursed, the withering started, but they kept, kept walking because they were on the way to the city. And then on the way into town the next day, they noticed that not only were the trees with uh, the leaves withered, but the fig tree, it says, was dried up from the root, from the roots, okay? Big difference than if the trees are just withered and just need a little water, okay? They specifically says it was uh, dried up from the roots. And that shows us that not only would there be no fruit and no leaves, that's important because that means even Jesus wasn't even going to let them be attractive on the outside so that they could trick people anymore. Okay? So there's, an, there's some spiritual significance to it being dried up from the root. Everybody catch that? So Mark records Peter's words as a statement. He, he says, uh, you know, look, Rabbi, or look, Jesus, that tree is cursed, is withered away. It doesn't sound like a question, but a question is inferred in that statement. Like, look, <laughs> how'd that happen? Matthew actually does record it as a question. He said the disciples marveled and asked, how'd you make that happen so soon? <laughs> how'd that happen? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, they, they walked with him, they talked with him, they saw it. And yet, how'd you do that? Well, Jesus went on to explain how it happened by faith without really explaining how it happened. <laughs> you, you get what I'm saying? I'm thinking the disciples really wanted to know exactly how a fig tree that looked healthy withered so quickly, right? That's what we want to know. We want the nuts and bolts, right? I want to know, how did you do that, Jesus? Give me the details. And his answer doesn't explain how this really happened other than by faith. He just said it, and it happened. And that's how it really is with miracles, right? Um, we get them, but we don't really get it. <laughs> we get miracles, but we don't get it. How does that happen? How did you do that? We don't know how he does it. We just know that he does it. And we know, as we've studied miracles all year, that it is often by faith. It's always by his power. But no matter what, miracles just seem to happen. They're like one of the other names for miracles is a wonder, a signs and wonders, right? It makes us wonder. It's a good thing. We ought to spend a little more time wondering. Not, not because we have to figure it out, but that's what attracts us um, to this supernatural power that our God has. I was at a women's conference this last weekend over in Maplewood, and miracles were happening, and it was, it was crazy. One woman fell off a motorcycle five years earlier. She injured her hamstring. Uh, it never healed properly, and she had constant pain. Uh, we didn't have, they didn't have a prayer line or anything. We were just worshiping for hours and hours. We'd worship before every teaching session. And at one point, we were just worshiping in his glory, and then miracles started happening to people. And then testimonies started coming out. So she was instantly healed. One woman had chronic kidney and bladder infections for 25 years. She said it was a miracle for her to be standing. She was way up front. I was in the back watching it all. And she, she, um, she said for her to be standing for this past hour was a miracle in itself because normally the pain in her back got so intense after just a couple minutes of standing that she couldn't handle it. She was instantly healed. I bet she was 70 or 80 years old. And she is up there, yes, yes, yes. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's cool, that's cool. Uh, rotator cuffs, one lady had fallen down steps and, and hurt both rotator cuffs. Hips were healed, eyes were opened, ears were unplugged. One lady said she had a, a buzzing, I don't know what that's called, muffled buzzing. Yeah, for, for over a year, instantly healed. And as I'm watching all of this and I'm, yes, Jesus, I mean, this is awesome. 
I was imagining that some people in the room wanted to know, how is this happening? <laughs> I mean, really, how is this happening, Jesus? I know that everyone in that room knew it was God doing it. I know they believed in God. And um, that's, it's, it's, it's a question that we all ask. How'd you do that? How'd that, how'd that happen so soon? And um, the better question I think that for us to ask is why? And that's why we're studying the miracles. Um, hopefully it creates faith in us to believe for them. Um, there were there were other miracles that were going on that day. Gold was a was happening, uh, um, appearing. <laughs> Can't think of a simple word like that. Gold and silver were appearing on people's hands, and people were like, "So what does that mean?" And I'm like, "I don't know, but how cool is that?" <laughs> you know, I mean, how cool is it that the glory just brought amazing um, things? Some people had oil. Anoint, just oil showing up in their hands. So I was praising and praising. <laughs> I kept checking. <laughs> that, that'd be fun. All right. So we want to understand the spiritual symbolism um, also about fig trees. See, for them, for the Jewish people, the presence of a fruitful fig tree symbolized blessing and prosperity. The absence or death of a fig tree symbolized judgment and rejection. It was well known, okay? Everybody knew what, what that meant. And so this curse represented the spiritual deadness of the Jewish religion, okay? That, that the scribes and the chief priests and the Pharisees and Sadducees and all of them practiced, that, the deadness of that, um, because all of that was hypocritical. It was hypocrisy. Um, they looked good on the outside, but they bore no fruit. Um, they sacrificed, they observed ceremonies, they did all the right stuff, but their hearts were far from him. Um, they were spiritually barren. They re were rejecting their Messiah. In fact, they would crucify him a few days <laughs> later. They lacked repentance, okay? So not only would they not bear fruit anymore, they wouldn't even be outwardly pretty or give the impression that if you just do the right stuff, everything's going to be okay. So God was, Jesus cursed their ability to convince people that they, that they were fruitful, okay? And the same holds true for us today. We are not to be pretenders, right, in the church? We're not to pretend, look good on the outside, and then on the inside just be unfruitful. Um, we have, all of us, when we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, have this incredible privilege of being planted and grafted, grafted into the Lord. We receive nourishment from him continually. Isn't that amazing? I mean, think about that. There's not a moment of the day that goes by that you're not being fed, that you're not being, nour being nourished, so that you could be fruit-bearing, so that you could bear fruit in and out of season. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine. You could say it with me probably by heart. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That's powerful. And Jesus is so serious about fruitfulness. There are consequences for fruitlessness. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. That doesn't preach very well, though, does it? <laughs> Notice that our fruitfulness is the result of what? What's it a result of? Abiding. Abiding. Our fruit is not the result of doing. It's an, a result of being, of abiding in Jesus. Mm -hmm. The scribes and Pharisees weren't abiding in Jesus. They were abiding in their religion. Jesus speaks more of fruit bearing there in verses 7 and 8. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. 
so you will be my disciples. Mm -hmm. Fruit bearing is part of being a disciple. Jesus emphasizes this because it is all about abiding. We are fruitful by nature. It's, it is, it's his nature. He is the vine. He produces fruit, right? It's in his nature, so it has to be in our nature because we are grafted in to him. And we bring our Father glory when we bear much fruit. That's good enough reason, right, to abide. So we learn from this miracle actually how to be fruitful, or better yet, how to let his fruitfulness propagate in our lives today as we study Jesus' teaching in response to Peter's statement. Remember, Peter said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. I mean, we could say that all sorts of ways. How he said it, I don't know. Was he astonished? Was he, you know, we don't know. Was he excited or was he like, whoa, how'd that happen? We don't, we don't really know, but it's Peter. <laughs> so, it, it, yeah, n enough said. It's Peter. I, I just think there was some excitement for him. Rabbi, look, look at, look at that tree that you cursed. It, it really did wither away. That's amazing. Starting at verse 22, do you have that? Did I write that in your study guide? I gave you more discussion questions this time for you to ponder at home. Let's read that together. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Again, that does not preach well, does it? <laughs> we do not want to hear that. But that, yeah, it makes sense. But this, this is where it gets, we, we get what this miracle, what God wants to convey to us through this miracle. So we're going to kind of walk through Jesus' response to Peter saying, look, you cursed it, and it really withered away, okay? Jesus tells us how to be fruitful and not wither through all of these, through what we just read. So the first thing Jesus did was speak a simple yet profound statement. Four words. What is it? Have faith in God. Have faith in God. I believe this is where, Mark, you, Pastor Mark, you said that in the original, it means to have the faith of God. Is, do you remember that? Yeah. yeah, and have faith in God. Yeah, that's exactly right. And have the faith of God. To have the faith of God, which really, I mean, that's just profound. So, but Jesus says, have faith in God. And to me, it really can't get any simpler than that. See, I think having faith in God simplifies everything in life, from the mundane to the extraordinary. Have faith in God when you wake up in the morning. <laughs> Have faith in God when you see a person who needs a hug and you're not a huggy person. Have faith in God when you pay your bills. Have faith in God when a relationship goes sour. Have faith in God when you're sharing Jesus with a stranger or with a friend who doesn't believe. Have faith in God when you walk out into the world to shine like a star for him. Have faith in God when you need a miracle. You see, to be fruitful, we have to have faith in God. Then Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you. That's a word we don't use much today, right? Assuredly. But listen, as, as sure as Jesus is God, he's saying, assuredly, as sure as I am God, I'm going to say this to you. It seems like such insignificant wording. But when Jesus is saying, he's with his disciples, assuredly I say to you, 
He's saying, as sure as I'm God, I'm going to say this to you, receive it inside. And that's truth number two. Believe with no doubt. Believe with no doubt. He said, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Now, it sounds a little bit like hocus pocus, doesn't it? I mean, just say, just say it, believe it, and I, okay, I believe it and I don't doubt. Okay. <laughs> Unless you follow truth number one, <laughs> have faith in God. See, saying and believing without doubting has everything to do with faith in God. Nothing to do with faith in ourselves or even in our faith to believe for something. It's faith in God. It is faith in God that seals the deal. Now, the word doubt in this context means to be in disagreement with oneself or to hesitate between two opinions. It's like being double-minded. I'm, I'm going to pray this, but you know what, Lord? You just make the decision. That's not believing. Okay? Should I or shouldn't I believe for that? Will it happen? Won't it happen? Yeah, no. Maybe, maybe not. I, can't, I don't know. I, I will just wait and see. You can expect to, to not have your prayer answered there. Is your prayer heard? Yeah. But Jesus is very serious here. He who believes and does not doubt will have. You, you can't. Jesus says if we don't do that, if we don't hesitate or don't entertain other options, if we don't doubt in our hearts but believe, we will have what we say or what, will be, what we say will be done. Okay? Now, our hearts here refer to the spiritual seat or the center of our being. It's kind of the mind, the soul, Everything, it's the deepest part of our beings. And again, people want that to be tangible. There's, it's not tangible. It's something that God has put in us, the seat of our emotions. This is where our thoughts, our passions, our desires, our appetites, our affections, our purposes, our endeavors, all of those things are deep, are set deep within. And so he says, don't doubt in your hearts, in the deepest place. You, can, you could say, I don't doubt, but in here you're doubting. And I, don't worry, I'm going to get to how we get there. <laughs> because most people are going to say, okay, I get that, but how? How does that work? Um, so we are not to doubt from the very depth of our beings, okay? Here's a very simple truth. We, well, it is impossible to doubt and to believe at the same time. You can't do both. When we doubt... Remember the meat, we're hesitating. We're disagreeing with ourselves. We're not sure. And that is not belief, okay? That's nothing to beat ourselves up over. I'm not saying that, but just call it what it is. It's not belief. You can't do both. Um, to believe means we trust Jesus. We trust that he is able to help us to get or do something. He's able. I'm not able. We read that before. We can do nothing without him. So, we trust and we believe, we get to that, we, we put doubt away and we come to believe by immersing ourselves in the word of God and prayer. That's how you stir up faith. That's how, it's not by just, oh God, give me more faith, or God, give me this, or that. His word is living and active. His word has everything that we need. It prospers for what it's sent. It doesn't return void. It's his word. And it's not just looking for what we want his word to say. It's immersing ourselves in his word and letting his word speak life into us. That's what creates faith. That's what shatters doubt. That's what shatters that disagreement that we have going on in our hearts and our minds. How can that work? How can that be? What if? What if he doesn't? What if he does? All of those things happen because we're not immersing ourselves in the word. And that is the only way that we can know his will in each particular situation. You know, if you want to grow in the prophetic, immerse yourself in the word. If you want to get a word from the Lord, immerse yourself in the word. We, he tells us that we need to ask believing with no doubt. 
You see, when we immerse ourselves in the word of God and we know what he's saying to us in any situation in life, that's how we keep ourselves from being disappointed in believing. How many people have ever bet, believed for something that didn't happen and you were super disappointed? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we want to know his will for every situation, right? I don't know. It's not okay for me to say, well, I think this is what I want, but your will be done. When, he, when Jesus says words like he said in this, you know, if you believe and, and, and you don't doubt from your heart, you will have whatever you say. I'm like, well, it can't be both ways then, right? It just doesn't make sense to me. Not that God has to make sense, but his word should make sense at some point to us. So Pastor Mark actually touched on this in his Affirm on Monday morning. He talked about how great it would be, he, would be to hear God's audible voice. Anybody listen to that or read that one? He said, wouldn't it be, I mean, how many of us don't want to hear God audibly? I mean, oftentimes I'd say, I've said, well, I need to hear God's audible voice before I do that. <laughs> and God's going, well, skip it then. <laughs> you know, you, you don't get to make the rules. <laughs> um, um, but he was talking about how it would be great to hear that so you'd know what decision to make, what road to take, what, what you're supposed to do. But, but I, I'll remind you that God is not a formula God, right? He's not a formula God. He doesn't say, if you do this and this, then you'll always get this. He gives us tools, and we keep using those tools, and then he expects us to rely on, on his word and his Holy Spirit to guide us to know what decisions to make. And it all comes back to having faith in God, to trusting that God is able and that God is willing to hear our prayers and to, to, to say, yeah, I'm going to you know, help you figure out what you're supposed to do. From the Message Bible, Pastor Mark actually read part of this that day. Matthew 11, 28 to 30 reads like this. Are you tired? Anybody tired? Yeah. Worn out? Burned out on religion? On religion, not on Jesus, but burned out on religion. Yes, I am. <laughs> and he says, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Of course, that's the whole yoke and burdens from the other translations. Now, some people might ask, but how? How does that happen? How am I supposed to know what, I, what to do just by going to Jesus and resting in him? Doesn't he want me to do something? Um, so how do we believe like that? How do we hear? And I'm going to tell you, it's just like miracles. They happen. We know that God does them. We don't know how he does them. But when we believe and we wait, he does them. We don't know how he does it. We just know he does, right? We do, however, know how to position ourselves. He just told us in the Bible, get away with him, walk with him, work with him, watch how he does it. And pretty soon, you don't know how it happens, but your answer is there. You know what to do. Oh, it probably didn't come when you wanted it to. You probably already did something else. <laughs> but if you just go to him and spend time with him, not just to get answers, but to learn from him. See, he, you don't have to ask him repeatedly. Well, I guess you can. I mean, it's fine. But I mean, we have, we, Pastor Mark and I have some decisions that we're trying to make and we, we pretty much circle the mountain daily, right? And come back to the same, a couple times daily, we circle the mountain. And, um, but in that process of talking it through, we're, we're learning to keep going to him. Not, Lord, you've got to answer me or else. But Lord, I just want to be with you. When the glory fell in that church this weekend, it wasn't because people were begging to be healed. I would guess that probably none of them were because we were, we were, it was a great worship song. <laughs> they were just abiding in him. They were just being with God. Let me give you an example of the importance of hearing and praying hearing God's will and praying God's will, especially in matters of life and death. 
How many people have ever heard of uh, Dr. R. A. Torrey? Is that, yeah, you have he, written many, many books. Um, wonderful preacher of the word um, back in, I mean, decades ago. He was a, 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 he had been a Christian for over 40 years when he was asked to visit a family and pray for a loved one who was dying of typhoid fever, actually asked to come give last rites or whatever you do. And before he went, Tori prayed and God revealed to him that the man would live. Important statement there, God revealed to him that the man would live. So when he arrived at their home, he shared God's will with the family and the medical doctor who was there waiting for this man to die. And the doctor said, well, that's fine for you to believe, but he cannot live. He will die. And Dr. Torrey replied, well, that's fine for you, but he cannot die. <laughs> he will live. He was sure because God had told him. As the evening wore on, though, the man showed final signs of impending death. And then, bam, he recovered. Dr. Torrey later emphasized in his book, The Power of Prayer and the Prayer of Power, <laughs> that he could pray for every sick person to recover. But he said he could not believe and not doubt for every sick person to recover. He could only do that when God revealed it, when God gave him faith that a person would live and not die. Mm -hmm. Did you catch the difference there? Mm -hmm. Only then could he pray without doubt, believing in his heart it would happen. Only when he had faith in God and when God had revealed his will. When you go to God and say, what's your will? See, here's the thing. We know God is healer, right? He is. We know he has the power and the desire to heal, heal. We also know God is Savior, right? By his power and grace and mercy, we are saved. We know Jesus died and, and when we die, we're going to. Yeah. So what we should be doing is asking his will for each situation. Healing, Lord? Heaven, Lord? How many Christians don't just pray and pray and pray for healing and then are left, well, they died. Our prayers didn't work. Did anyone consider asking the Lord what his will was? And I know we say, well, we pray for healing until he don't, they don't get healed. That just totally contradicts what Jesus said here, though, that if you pray without doubt in your heart. Well, if I pray for healing, but I'm entertaining the idea that they can die anyways, I'm not really doing what, God, what Jesus said to do, right? Yeah. Is this the time for them to be healed and live here on earth? Is this the time for them to be healed and live in heaven? God wants to talk with us about those things. See, then and only then can we really pray in faith without doubting, and it will be done for us, as Jesus said. Then and only then will we not hesitate, will we not rock back and forth between two opinions, will we not say, well, we want healing, but if you want with them with you, Lord, your will be done. I used to get so confused about this whole healing thing, because when we were walking in the Pentecostal charismatic, I just thought, just pray for healing, and then you walk in this realm, and it's just like, God, just touch them and comfort them until they die, or, you know, God wants to talk to us, and he wants to t share his will with us. We all got to die, and we're all going to resurrect when we believe in Jesus Christ. So what, what does he want? And I want to pray like Jesus prayed after he cursed the fig tree because I don't want to be a withering. <laughs> I don't want to wither away from the roots. Lord, I want to have that faith that goes deep in my roots. And this goes for any situation and decision. Pray, read his word, spend time in his word, wanting to know what his will is. Wait on him. Walk with him, as we just read in Matthew. Rest in him. It happens. It happens when we have faith in God rather than faith in our ability to hear. We will hear. People say, I can't hear from God. You will hear. You will hear when you spend time in his word and you just let God have at you. Most often what we do when we don't know what to do is say we can't hear God, so we just go ahead and we do something because we got to do something instead of getting up and getting away with God and waiting. 
we end up in those situations praying our will. And then we get upset with God or we question his ability or we question our own faith. Seeking his will, I, I got to tell you something, friends. Seeking his will, waiting on him so that we can believe and not doubt, it requires time and sacrifice. There's no shortcuts here. It's not like, I mean, it'd be great if, like, R.A. Tori, okay, he's going to live, you know. That was just one time, though. We have no idea how much time R.A. Tori spent with the Lord, nurturing that relationship so that he could hear like that because they were, he was in that relationship. It requires time. It requires sacrifice. And God isn't like a little puppy that's at our bidding. So we're going to have to do what he tells us to do. Get away with him. Are you tired, wore out, burned out? Get away from me. Come to me. Rest. When Jesus says anything in life, I mean anything in his word, we should promptly obey and receive it, even when it's not necessarily what we want to hear, right? <laughs> but when he says things a second time in the same conversation, he probably knew we were going to question him <laughs> and try to find another option, right? So in verse 24, Jesus reiterates the truth, believe and receive. This time he says, therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. He just kind of reworded it, right? Same thing that he just said about the mountain. And I will say that that sounds a lot like name it, claim it theology, right? How many people know what name it, claim it theology is? Name it, I have it. If I don't claim it or if I don't name it, I can't claim it. And... I don't think that really sounds a lot like Jesus. Just name it, claim it. Does it to you? I mean, that, I don't think that's how he operates. So what does he mean when he says, believe that you receive them and you will have them? What does he mean? And we have only to go back to John 15 to find that answer. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. See, our desires then come from where? Our heart. And what is, well, according to this verse, where do our desires come from? Word. <laughs> His words. People are like, well, I don't trust my desire. Well, if you're in the word, he says, if you, if, Jesus says, if, <laughs> if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you will ask what you desire. Because, see, then our desire is what his word. Okay. See, it's not about getting things. It's not about naming it and claiming it. It's about abiding in his word, in him, and letting his word dwell richly in us, asking for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not our will, his will. His will and his desire for that person. That becomes our will and our desire for that person or for the world. So it's not about just saying whatever your will is, Jesus, either. He wants us to know his will. He wouldn't have said what you say. If, he, if, if all we had to say is, well, Jesus, you just have your way. You do whatever you want to do. He wouldn't have written all this out for us and said it twice <laughs> in this one section. Have faith in God. Abide in Jesus, and we can trust that our asks will reflect his wants, his desires. Our desires will be his desires. This faith in God creates oneness. I have to tell you that when we have faith in God, Jesus' first response, um, we'll pray like Jesus prayed in, J in John 17, and we'll actually walk in that. If you remember that, they, Jesus prayed to his Father that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us. We're one with him, that the world may believe. The purpose isn't so that we'll all believe in here, but the world would believe that the